Hi, it's Bernardo Moya, and welcome to Inspiring People. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Marie Diamond, who is the global transformational leader. She's also an inspirational, motivational speaker, author, international authority in so many different things like feng shui and dowsing. Hi, Marie, how are you? Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a great pleasure. Uh, Please tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? What was your early years like? Well, I'm actually from Belgium, from a beautiful city called Bruges. I don't know if you've ever been there. No, I haven't. And so, actually, I grew up there in, a, I would say, a normal family. Uh, in in that sense, that normal, like my family had lived in Canada for about 10 years before I was born. So we had a lot of international connection already as I grew up. You know, I spoke several languages already. But I would say the, the major thing for me was, like, I could always see energy from as an early child on and so I could see the aura field and the chakras and the energy field of people around me and how old were you when you already started um, that I remember about five years that I really have this very clear experience of saying things and feeling things and but I thought everybody had it actually to be honest I thought it was normal yeah and so but uh, it was not and um, and I became very very super sensitive to everything that was happening around me and when I was seven, I actually met my uh, spiritual teacher, and uh, he actually told me my first meditation. So I was actually meditating since I was seven. Wow. And uh, he was actually teaching me about quantum physics, but of course, in a, in a way that for a child it was <laughs> understandable. And he gave me actually the, always the, the idea to draw everything I wanted to accomplish in my life. So he said, every day draw again what you want. So I wanted to have a happy family. So I was creating always a happy family. And he gave me five colors to work with. It was citrus green, light blue, uh, rose, yellow, and purple. And so these are very important colors. Later on, you will understand. And so I was actually always drawing all the dreams I wanted to have. So in a way, I was creating a daily vision board, you know, (laughs) if you think about it. And this is how I started connecting with the law of attraction as a child. So I always suggest people for children, like, let them draw every day, like, or as much as they can, their dreams because there's like something they're opening up to the possibility that this is possible in their world. And was um, were you good in school? Did you like school? Any subjects in particular? Yeah, you, you no, liked? I was really good at school. I was a, a very good student in mathematics, my first. Okay. <laughs> and history, I love that. And then when I was 15, something major happened. I had uh, an accident. I was run over by a truck. And I ended up, um, you know, in coma. And they declared me dead for, you know, a few minutes first. But I actually went, what they call, to the other side. And um, when I was there, I was receiving a message that I was here to enlighten more than 500 million people. And so I actually came back. And I thought, like, okay, I don't know how to do this. But uh, I got a lot of neurological problems from memory uh, losses I had after that. So I, from a a straight A student, I became a straight F student. And uh, so then I asked my teacher, what can I do for that? I said, learn to meditate more. So I started really every morning, start my connection with my soul and connecting it with alpha brainwaves. So to really open up to, uh, to memory that I normally would have forgotten. And so what happened because of that, I was tapping into uh, what we would call the omnipresence, the consciousness. And, um, and this is how I actually got through my um, uh, high school. I became a lawyer. Um, that was like one of the things I wanted to do because I felt like I wanted to reach so many people in the world. And so like, perhaps I need to become a politician <laughs> <laughs> to really reach so many people. And but what made you wanting to go into law? Well, I, one of the things was I already knew a lot about the universal laws. Okay. And I wanted to see how humans were actually reacting to that, what was the law of human uh, of humanity. And so I actually studied that to understand better the structures and the strategies of people. And I also actually studied criminology because I wanted to know if um, people are in their worst behavior, you know, if I could understand that and have compassion with them. So I actually did this two studies, and there was also a minor in psychology and all this, because I, I really wanted to know how human behavior was, not just the, the quantum field, but, you know, in a three-dimensional level. And uh, after studying that, um, I became a lawyer for the Belgian government and, and also worked with the European government. And when I was doing that for about five years, 
I decided it was time to let go of that political world and that traditional world and I started becoming a, a, a spiritual teacher. So I actually started teaching meditation. Uh, how old were you then? When you I was 31. 31. Okay, yeah. cool. So yeah. at the age of 31, you thought, yeah. I've done enough of that I've done now. enough of that. Uh, well, it didn't follow. go anywhere, I think, because <laughs> it's like, how could I really impact the world yeah. um, through politics at that time? I had to make some choices that I didn't want to take, you know, to go into certain political parties. And I thought I want to stay as observant as possible. So I didn't decide for that. So I became actually um, a teacher, and my first clients, interesting enough, were the politicians. So because I was working with a lot of politicians in government, and they were always asking me, you know, you're always so optimistic, you're always so positive, you always have a lot of energy, you always stay calm in any negotiation. How do you do that? And I said, well, I meditate, <laughs> you know. And this is how actually my first clients were people in the government that wanted to really uh, learn how to be like me, optimistic and joyful and, and calm and peaceful. Yeah. Was there, uh, I normally ask, I mean, you know, sometimes people have several turning points in their life. But was there a particular turning point of what made you go on the journey that, that you started then or you are now, you're on now? Um, I think my whole life was prepared for that. Uh, but I think... Um, a big turning point was when I was 25, um, when I just had finished all my uh, studies, and uh, my father was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, I couldn't help him. He was just so closed off. He was not awakened. And so I really felt like if only I could have, you know, woken him up on time to perhaps not go to this turmoil in his life. Um, that definitely was a major turning point. And also, I had some really issues with him, uh, a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of physical abuse with him. And um, I was able and uh, to forgive him completely before he passed on. And I really felt how much that lifted me up, that I was able to completely forgive him. But I didn't only forgive him for myself, I also forgive him a name of everyone he ever heard it. And he heard quite a few people. And so for me to really see how uh, my life changed by um, allowing forgiveness, by allowing to connect in with a uh, higher consciousness. At that moment, I thought like, you know, it has been such a lonely journey for me because even I had a spiritual teacher, I didn't know anyone until I was about 28 that was on, in the transformational journey like we are. And so I said, if only I could help one person in the world to really shift, you know, from sadness and anger and pain into feeling so much light through forgiveness, through working on yourself, I will definitely uh, take on that journey. And I still had that that goal of like every day I was asking the universe, show me how to reach 500 million people, show me how to impact people to really transform their life. And so I was, I was thinking first, okay, you go into politics or support the politicians and the government. And then I really felt like there must be another way. And when I was 31, I really, one day I woke up and said, this is not it. This is not going anywhere. So let me start teaching what I already have learned since I'm, you know, 15. And immediately there were people, you know, ready for it. And before I knew it, I was reaching within six months, thousand people. So like, oh, there's a... Had, what, yeah. what did you start teaching? Or I was teaching the inner diamonds. Okay. It was like a meditation that uh, really how to connect in with your soul um, in a very easy way. I'm a very practical person, mm -hmm. you know, as a lawyer. And so for me, it was like, okay, these are the steps. You take these steps and you go to what we call alpha brain waves or even going into higher brain waves, theta and delta brain waves. And so I was teaching them to really be very open-minded. And I work with a lot of colors to do that. But then after a while, I started seeing that a lot of these things, the people were not, they were opening up, but they were also closing down again. And then I started really introducing them something else I learned since I was 15. So after my uh, near-death experience, uh, I also asked my teacher, why did this happen to me? You know, why had I this awful experience? Why did I lose all this memory? And uh, why did I attract bad luck? You know, I already was aware of the law of attraction. And he said, well, you have bad feng shui. I thought like, okay, bad feng shui, what is that about? And so he said, well, your environment is not supporting your goals. And he said, where you sleep, and I have to be honest, I hated that bedroom. It was like the, the wallpaper, like you 
you know, my sister's room, you know, when she's out of the house, you take it, you know. But it was nothing connected with me. And he said, why don't you change the room, change the color, put images around you that are very powerful. Uh, so for those that don't understand, explain a little bit about, about feng shui and how, where does it originate from and yeah. how does it work? Well, feng shui means actually wind and water. So it's a, a considered, um, I would say, a science in the Chinese uh, information. So the Chinese, already for about 4,000 years, they started understanding that there were influences from the environment on people's happiness. So I would say 4,000 years ago, they would be called shamans, probably, right? And uh, But they were actually seeing probably how the energy from the landscape of people living in their houses were actually influencing um, the way they were thinking, they were feeling, and they would say the good luck that happened to them. Yeah, so let's rewind yeah. and then let's fast forward. Yeah. So you you understood the importance of, of, yeah. of helping people yeah. with this, and then obviously it became a very important part of, yes, of, of who is. you became. And yeah. So it was this a transition of you moving from Europe to, to L.A.? Yeah, well, it was really interesting. Um, you know, I was uh, living in Belgium. I was already doing a lot of work in Europe, but reaching 500 million people, <laughs> you know, I was like, that's not going to happen here. So uh, one day I was starting already teaching in, uh, in LA and in San Francisco, uh, both meditation and feng shui, because for me, meditation is inner feng shui somehow, right? Uh, organizing your energy. And uh, I woke up one day and was like, okay, you have to be here in three weeks. And so I got this voice of my master and said, okay, I'm moving. So I called my husband and said, start packing. We're moving in three weeks. And I did. And if I would not have been there, I would have missed a sequence of um, situations that happened to me uh, and attracting really um, being in the secret. Yeah. And as you said, you, you, you worked with so many people. You decorated yeah. so many amazing yeah. homes. Uh, so tell us about the secret because obviously yeah. that was kind of like a – uh, I don't know, a big step into yeah. into your career and you becoming such a, a global phenomenon. How did that come? How did it all happen? Yeah. Well, it was actually the third meeting of our Transformation Leadership Council that uh, Jack Enfield had created. And a few weeks before, I had this dream that a woman, uh, a blonde, half long blonde woman, would come to me and she said in my dream, I'm from Australia, pay attention when I come in your life. I'm like, okay. So I woke up with that dream. And so two weeks later, I'm in Aspen, Colorado, and uh, I'm at the back of the, the room. I was still very shy, to be honest. All these amazing people. I felt not, you know, worthy, to be honest, <laughs> to be there. And so I'm sitting in the back of the room. There's one place left, and this woman shows up and said, Hi, I'm Rhonda Byrne from Australia. I'm like, oh, there you are. <laughs> right, so what, what are you about? And he said, well, I'm doing this um, interview for a movie, The Secret. It's for the Australian Network. And she said, you know, a lot of people don't want to do the interview. I said, oh, I'm ready for you, right? So tell me, what do I need to do? And she said, wow, you're so enthusiastic. I said, yes, I got a dream about you. So she interviewed me, and that was actually my first TV interview ever. I'd never been on camera before. Mm -hmm. So I was really starting, Amazing. right? And But I knew that it was going to be very powerful because I had asked for being in a movie seen by millions of people. So it was in Australia, it was on the biggest network, so I would be with millions of people. But at that time, of course, you know, there was, um, we had no idea where it would go. And then she actually moved to LA, and um, and things were not going well at that time. The network had uh, canceled the movie, they didn't put it out in Australia. So she had no idea what to do with the movie. She had put a, a lot of her money in it. And so uh, she called me and said, I'm stuck, and I said, but let me just yeah. rewind a minute because from what I gather, you are the secret behind the secret yeah. because there's a lot of people that didn't want to be involved yeah. in it and, and it was thanks to you that they were involved. Yeah. Is that the case? Well, I would say it differently. Yeah. It's like um, she chose the people to be in the movie, but as the movie got stuck, um, actually that's when she asked my help. And so I did her feng shui. Okay. And interesting enough, at the same time, in the same weeks, I was asked by a publishing company to come in because they were like, we're at the edge, or we're going to you know, go for a chapter 11. We have heard you need to come in and then things start happening for, you, for us. I said, okay, I'll come. And so I said, we only have this amount of money. We're just really at the edge. I said, okay, I'll come. And so I was rearranging their offices and said, oh, before you leave, um, 
I actually uh, have this DVD called The Secret. I think you need to look into it. I think you need to make a book out of that. And so they looked at it, and so they connected with Rhonda. They asked her to do the book. Um, I kind of helped with the, the cover, like to do the right colors for her feng shui of the book cover. And uh, But I already had so many people in The Secret, like Jack and Marcia Sharma of Bob Proctor, John Gray, they were all clients of mine. And they were all kind of stuck at a certain moment when I came in and I rearranged their furniture, rearranged their homes, and they started having much more success again because they had like hit the ceiling and I opened up the ceiling. And so also the publisher, the public, um, the PR person, um, all these people were actually by coincidence my clients. And so that's why people call me the secret behind the secret, because I actually was the common factor and for a lot of these people to open up, um, I would say, the next chapter in their life. Yeah. And what an amazing story, the, yeah. the secret, such a, yeah. a, and even still. Uh, it's still, yeah. yeah. It is, uh, I would say, um, I call it the the most classic movie of the, the self-development. So, so many millions of people have been opened up to start believing that um, perhaps they have a responsibility in their life, they can do something to change their life. Um, I remember one day uh, we heard that the movie was shown in Ghana, in country Ghana, and that six million people were watching the movie in Ghana. Then I knew, it was like the first year, then I knew this movie would be forever. Mm. And um, and still today, you know, wherever I go, you meet people. I was just in, in Budapest, and they're like, people coming up like, oh my God, you're from The Secret, you changed my life. And I said, well, you know, it's you who changes your life. We're just inspiration for you to change your life. And so it will be an, a nonstop inspirational movie and book. Uh, and the, the people that have chosen, um, I would say, the people that are chosen uh, to be in that movie, because there were about seven in, 70 interviews, and um, it was really interesting, 24 were chosen to be in it. Um, I think all these people had a really big um, vision already of the world. They already had a really big vision to support people. I think also Rhonda, she was really thinking about changing billions of people's lives. So we all had a very big vision, and we also had a lot of heart. Um, and I think that's what people feel in the secret. It's the heart also. It's not just the wisdom. It's like the people that are in there are genuinely really want to help people. Mm. Yeah. So I suppose obviously from then on, all sorts of things started happening, yeah. uh, speaking all over the world. So what was your journey? What happened from then onwards? Well, I actually, I, at the beginning, I was not prepared for that, to be honest. You know, I was like, I just moved into America. So for me, it was a, a very interesting journey because I did not know the what we call the self-development human potential industry. So I had to learn a lot of things, but I, I got some wonderful partners around me. And um, so I was just living, you know, my vision. I was wanted to reach millions of people, and now I was able to do that. So I set up my own uh, Diamond School, Diamond Feng Shui School, and connect with as much people as I could, and uh, so I started traveling the world, and um, it has been, you know, fulfilling my passion to be there for so many people worldwide, and, um, you know, in all the continents, it's just an amazing journey um, to teach people, um, you know, the basics of, I would say, what we call Diamond Feng Shui, uh, to work with the personal energy number, to make sure that all these wonderful teachings they get from the self-development teachers, then when they would go home, that it really starts anchoring into their life. So it's not just an aha moment in a workshop, but um, or an aha moment when they do coaching or mentoring, but that their environment is supporting them. Because that's where I see the missing link in a lot of the human potential movement. Like they go from one workshop to another, mm. but they're never integrating, they're never anchoring it in the environment where they live. And so that's my contribution most of the time uh, when people come to see me. It's like they're going to look into their home and saying, okay, or my office, this is what I want as a new thinking, this is how I want as a new vision, but is my environment reflecting what I want? Because you know it's about 87 to 90 percent, everything is subconscious. So your environment is giving you subconsciously messages all the time. Yeah, so it's giving you messages uh, of success and money, uh, 
relationships, health, wisdom. Like yesterday evening, I was in somebody's apartment, you know, and their relationship is not going so well. And they're like, uh, so I come into the bedroom. I mean, there's nothing from even a picture of both, you know, of the couple. It was just an image of a, a lonely cow, actually. It was a, cow, <laughs> a lonely cow. And I'm thinking, all right, this is not going to give you romance, any, right? Worse, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, they also had mirrors reflecting the bed. So mirrors always kind of doubles the people that are in it. So it kind of creates always communication issues. Explain to me about the app because yeah. uh, it's a yeah, fantastic great. app. I've downloaded yeah. it myself. Yeah. And, and, and don't worry about the demonstration. We'll show it on the okay, screen. Wonderful. Uh, so when uh, people download it, as yeah. you said, the, you have a number, which yeah. int- uh, and then... When you download the app, you position it within the room and Correct. it tells you the parameters. Yeah. Please explain the yeah. whole process and how it works. Well, anyhow, I will take the app because it's easier for me to, to explain. Um, so the Mary Diamond app, it's, of course, available on uh, all the possibilities um, for iPhone and Android. So everybody has a, based on their birthday, they have a certain direction of energy in their life. And so there are four compass directions that are really strong for you. One for success, one for health, one for your relationships, and one for your wisdom or motivation. And so people actually on the app, they fill in their birthday. Mm -hmm. And so you have to choose men or women, it's different for gender. And they put in their birthdays, and then they click on find your energy number. And then they get actually a compass, right? And on the compass, they will see success direction, health, relationship, and wisdom. Yeah. So what people do is they actually hold the compass in their hands and they stand in the center of a room. The center of the room, okay. So I always say for the three places to go first is your bedroom uh, for your romantic life, your office for your business experiences, and your living room because that's where your social life is occurring. And so when you're holding that and you check out like here, you know, for a certain person, success would be in that area. Now, they have to, for example, look what is hanging there, what is standing there. If this is telling a different story than success, right, then it actually will give them subconsciously all the time, 24 hours a day, influence on their energy. Yeah. So, for example, that lonely cow from yesterday, right, it was in the relationship direction of the man, right? So the man feels lonely. Like, that's his experience. Each time he goes to bed, he has a subconscious message, I act like... So if in that case you're standing in the room and and on that side, for example, success, what would you do in that side of the room then? in an office, for example, I would definitely put the logo of your company. I would put, if you have products or services, you can uh, put them there or hang them there as the flyers, the business cards. So whatever is there needs to be 24 hours a day telling you this is my success, your goals, your vision board. Okay. Yeah. So you'll see through the app, like every five days, they get a golden step. So they actually are guided in 80 days to reorganize their home. Yeah. In particular, obviously, a lot of people that are starting, uh, they're either trying to reinvent yeah. themselves or mm-hmm. their lives, either because, you know, they, they want a new start or yeah. they're, you know, they lost their jobs. What would you say the best things to have, know or be aware of yeah. are in order to, to do that, yeah. to be able to reinvent yourself? Well, I think before you reinvent yourself, I think you need to really come uh, to a conclusion of what has happened in your life. And I think the best conclusion is always to, to look at your life and say, look, this is the things I've learned from it. Uh, these are the challenges I had um, in that time of my life. Um, I forgive myself for the challenges I created. I also forgive the people that have co-created the challenges with me. Because I don't think you can reinvent yourself and start all over if you don't like really say thank you to what you have experienced before. Uh, and many years from now, many, many years from now, yeah. what would you like your legacy to be? Well, I think my legacy I would like to be is that um, that there's a, um, a holistic approach, I think, for uh, changing your life. So it's not just the mind um, that needs to be focused on and um, changing the mindset, but that there's also how the heart feels, uh, how your environment is set up. So I think that holistic approach, um, I think, I hope that remains uh, a legacy. And I see that already in the self-development, in the self, in the human potential movement, is that I'm probably the only person really talking about that. And I see a lot of people changing and saying, finally, all my exercises, my coaching, it's like it's coming easier now because my environment is supporting them. 
So if I could bring feng shui in a beautiful collaboration with uh, the human potential movement, I think that would be a great legacy. And, you know, I think the greatest legacy would be to have more happy people when you leave the world, you know, that people are more inspired and are more awakened and, and they can contribute in a better way to their family and their communities and their countries. I think that would be the, the greatest legacy for me. Marie, thank you so much. That was yeah. so great. Thank you thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much, Thank you. And thank you for watching Inspiring People. Thank you.